A viewer recently asked me how he can verify that the amplitude modulation percentage that he set on his signal generator is actually what the signal generator is producing. So in this short video, we'll take a look at how to measure this on an oscilloscope. So the first thing we'll do is take a look at the theory, if you will. So what I'm showing here is essentially the envelope of the RF signal, which would be wiggling very quickly uh, in here, mod modulated by a sinusoid. And with amplitude modulation, you're essentially going to get the amplitude of the carrier at any point in time is proportional to that baseband signal. So if the signal is not being modulated at all, we could see that the carrier level would be right here along this, this line right here. We call that the carrier voltage. Now the amount that that carrier amplitude is increased or decreased is the modulation voltage. We'll call that VM. Now the modulation index for an amplitude modulated signal or an AM signal is simply VM divided by VC. And of course we if we want to represent that as a modulation percentage, we simply take that modulation index and multiply it by 100%. Now measuring this modulation voltage directly might not be so easy because you kind of have to estimate what the carrier level is or go to the generator, turn the modulation off, measure that, and then measure the difference. So they're not the easiest me uh, measurements to make on the scope. However, it's actually a little bit easier to measure these two parameters. We'll call them the trough and the peak voltage, you know, from here to here. From those two, we can derive these measurements very easily. We can see that VM uh, is essentially half of the voltage between VT and VP, right, the, the peak and the trough. So simply one-half times the peak voltage minus VT gives us VM. And the carrier voltage is really the average of the trough and the peak voltage. So it's half of the sum of those two. So VC is one-half the sum of VP plus VT. So we can simply put those two over each other, you know, VM over VC. We'll just replace it with these equations. We're going to basically just stick a line here. The one-halves drop out and you're left with this equation peak minus the trough divided by the peak plus the trough. Multiply that by 100% and we've got our modulation percentage. So I've got this signal generator set up to give me a carrier frequency of 14.2 megahertz, just kind of arbitrarily set by me, uh, using amplitude modulation and with a sine wave shape using a 1 kilohertz baseband frequency and I've set the modulation depth for this uh, test case at 50%. So let's go take a look at this on the scope and make some measurements and see if we get 50%. Now I've got a nice steady uh, RF envelope here. It's in the RF is wiggling very, very quickly in between here. Uh, it's so, uh, so fast that we really can't see it, so we wound up getting this kind of shaded envelope. And the 1 kilohertz modulation can be seen kind of changed in the envelope of the RF signal. I've got a nice steady result here uh, because of some things that I've done with the setup. I'll talk about what I did and then what you might have to do on your end if you don't have some of the same features. Now one of the challenges when trying to do a measurement like this on a digital scope is getting the acquisition parameter set right. You know, we want to set up you know, at a relatively slow you know, time per division setting. In this case I'm using 200 microseconds so that we can get you know, a cycle or two of the baseband waveform on the screen. Now the challenge with that is that that baseband waveform is probably going to be at audio frequencies like this one kilohertz signal that we're looking at here. But the RF signal itself you know, that we're modulating in this case is you know, 14 megahertz. So the sample rate has to be high enough to not alias that waveform and, and give us a nice clean picture. So that means we need relatively slow sweep speed and a relatively high sample rate. That translates to needing a lot of memory. So with this scope, I was able to dial in you know, a 10 million point record length, and that gives me 5 gigasample per second sample rate, certainly enough to capture what's going on. But what if you do if you don't have that available to you? So let's take a look at some techniques. So let's look at what happens if you don't have you know, that large record length available. Let me dial this down to, say, you know, a kilosample. So at a kilosample, we can see that you know, I'm not quite getting a nice clean envelope here. And part of the problem is, at 1,000 points for the waveform, I'm only getting 500 kilosample per second. That is way, way less than the RF frequency. So we're undersampling the RF frequency pretty dramatically. And that's why we're kind of seeing this thing jumping around. And it's essentially aliasing the RF carrier. Uh, so what can you do? 
Now all digital scopes, when you dial down you know, to these slower time per division settings and the sample rate drops, the actual sample rate of the scope isn't really dropping off. What's happening is the scope is just throwing away samples. So there are, the scopes will have different sample modes available that will allow you to decide what to do with those samples you're throwing away. In the sampled mode, which is the way that most scopes operate by default, it's going to save the sample it needs, toss the rest until it gets to the next sample that it needs for the waveform, and then grab the next one. So it's really decimating points. But rather than decimate those points, the scopes will often offer you a peak detect function. And what that will do is we'll take a look at all those points that contribute essentially to one sample point on the waveform and record the positive uh, and the highest and lowest values. And that gives you this kind of uh, peak to peak view. Now, you're not going to get the nice shaded area okay, in here, but you will get a nice, good, clean envelope. So that's one technique you can use, is take a look at, see if your scope has got a peak detect sample mode. Now, some scopes will also take that peak detect mode and enhance it further by continuing to add to that peak detect over time. And that's what this envelope mode does. So you can actually pick that envelope mode and actually even determine over how many sample intervals or, or acquisition intervals we build that envelope up. So you can get a good clean picture of the envelope uh, that way. So these are two techniques that you can use if you don't have the record length in your scope to support direct sampling of the RF envelope. But uh, if, you can, if you can dial up the, uh, the record length to where you need it, um, then you can kind of go back to just the normal sample mode and get a nice live waveform. Now the second challenge you typically run into when trying to get a nice stable RF envelope on your uh, oscilloscope is triggering. Now I'm, I, what I'm actually doing, if you look carefully, my trigger source right here says channel 2. So the signal generator actually puts out a pulse that is synchronous with the 1 kilohertz modulation. So I'm actually, you know, I've just turned that channel on, so that, that's actually what I'm triggering on. So that's why I'm getting a nice stable result. Now, if your signal generator doesn't have an analog output or an output that is synchronous to the modulation that it's putting on the amplitude, uh, the amplitude modulated carrier, you know, then you may have to trigger on the RF signal itself. And if we do that, if we go to my trigger engine here and tell it I want to trigger on channel 1 instead of channel 2, let me turn channel 2 off. Now you can kind of see, we can wiggle things around here. In fact, if I can grab my trigger level, you can kind of see that level moving up or down. And if we're triggered way down here in the middle, it's just going to look like a free-running, ugly thing because we're just triggering on the RF carrier. But if we move that trigger level up towards the top of the envelope, we'll get fairly stable. Okay, It's not going to be perfect, but it's certainly going to be enough for you to be able to make a measurement. Uh, the other thing you can do is say, well, okay, it looks like I got a decent enough waveform. I could just hit stop on the scope, pause it, and make the measurements on that static waveform. So that's another way to get a stable, you know, standing still waveform for you to go and make the measurements on. Now, in our case, I will just take advantage of the fact that I have channel 2 available to me. I'll just set up the trigger source to trigger on channel 2, get a nice stable result, turn channel 2 off, and now I can just go make the measurements themselves on the RF envelope. So now all we need to do is measure this peak value right here and the trough value right here. Knowing those two, we can easily compute the modulation percentage. Now I'm going to do this using cursors. Uh, the cursors on the scope can often be set up to be in a couple of different modes. In this case, I'm doing screen cursors because a waveform cursor is just going to find points on the waveform, but we really just want to get that level, like a, a horizontal uh, cursor. So I'm going to change it to screen cursors, which allow me to essentially have these levels that I can go look at. And just using the multi-purpose knobs, I can move them around and establish, you know, and make the measurements essentially at that peak and trough level. And they look to be right about there. Let's see. So there's my peak level, and then there's my trough level. Now, according to the cursor readout, my peak is at 338 millivolts. My trough is at 114. Let's run the calculation. All right, now I'm old school, so I'm going to use the RPN calculator here, but you can feel free to do this on your regular calculator as well. So uh, we've got a, a peak of 338, and then our trough is uh, 114. We'll subtract those. And again, we'll add our 338 and 114, add those together, and divide them. And you can see I get 
0.495. Okay, so that's 495 times 10 to the minus 3, but that's 0.495. That would be 49.5%. Now we dialed in the uh, generator to be uh, 50%, so that's within a half a percent of that, and that's easily within the probably the measurement error of uh, what I've got on the scope. So we've easily verified that we asked for a 50% modulation depth, and we're basically getting 50% modulation depth. Let's do one more case here, and uh, let's dial in uh, the, the peak value there and the trough value, say, right down there. And we can see I've got 406 and 46. Let's run that calculation, and then we'll see if it matches what I set up on the generator. Now you'll notice when I'm running the numbers, I'm not putting in the fact that it's 406 millivolts, I'm just putting in 406. At the end of the day, those units would cancel out. So I'll dial in, say, 406 for my peak, and 46 for my trough, and subtract those. Let's put those numbers in again, 406, and then 46. We sum those together, and divide the result, and I'm getting 79.6%, or 0.796, as a modulation index. So let's take a look at what I put on the signal generator. And indeed, I set that up for 80%. So again, it's uh, just under a half a percent off uh, from what I'd set it to. So I would say that's uh, close enough. I hope you enjoyed today's short video on how to verify the modulation depth setting on your signal generator using your digital oscilloscope and some cursors and a little bit of calculations. If you liked the video, give me a thumbs up. And thanks again, as always, for watching. We'll see you next time.